uh, just to be uh, mindful of uh, time. Uh, uh, I'm sure we're still going to have people uh, drifting in, but wanted to uh, kick things off. I'm Stu Hendrickson. I'm the executive director here at the Berkman Klein Center. We are so thrilled that all of you are here, that uh, you're interested in the center. We're looking forward to finding ways for you to engage with it. Um, a whole variety of different opportunities for that, both in our programming, with our programs, with the people who are here, and these, uh, uh, the internet and society I joined here, just by way of background, I joined here from having been in private practice before that as an IP and commercial emerging tech lawyer for the last few decades. Um, and I did so in part because the internet and its challenges with society are the issues that I think are gonna define our days and the next uh, few chapters. And I'm hoping that with the intellectual thought leadership and the convening power that we have here and the community that we build with you and others, that we can tackle these really fundamental societal channels, challenges that we're facing. So really looking forward to that. Wanted to, uh, Introduce uh, Jay Z, who many of you know, the co founder of the Institute, faculty here. I couldn't possibly list all Jay Z's titles, so I'm not going to try, but um, really has been behind the leadership here. And we're going to start with a presentation that Jay Z is going to do. But please come around, and I look forward to meeting you, talking with you, having you meet our staff and teams that are uh, working here to try to drive change in this space. Thank you. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, as uh, Sue said, I'm Jonathan Zipkin, not that Jay-Z, and sometimes uh, results in disappointed expectations. Uh, but I do have jay-z.org, the domain name, due to an unhealthy interest in domain names 20 years ago. Um, <laughs> my ship will come in with that as a uh, possible investment. And speaking of possible investments, uh, apart from simply welcoming you all, thanking you for coming out to learn more about uh, our Center for Internet and Society and kind of walking with us on this journey together, whether you're taking your first steps or have been with us uh, for a while or uh, in staggered ways, and whether you're here in person or potentially virtually, since we're using the wonderful proprietary Zoom protocol, which includes, since I think we paid extra for Zoom premium, this weird gray line at the top <laughs> to indicate that we are special. Um, but I was talking about investments, and I thought I would just open with a kind of ripped from the headlines thing from last year that I've been puzzling my way through. Um, this is Beeple, aka Michael Winkleman. Michael, if you're tuned in, hello. And uh, he's a graphic designer slash digital artist who did this really cool project where uh, he created something digitally every day. And uh, he started quite a while ago, uh, 2007, and has been at it for more than 5,000 consecutive days. All right, that's pretty cool. Uh, he then decided to make a mosaic of those 5,000 works uh, pictured here. And he then decided to auction off an NFT of the work through Christie's. Uh, you may have heard of NFTs. I don't know if you've heard of Christie's, but it's an auction house. <laughs> and uh, this is a kind of normal thing Christie's might auction. It's an untitled painting. You can see the details uh, over in the corner. And it's signed. And it tells you a little bit of details. It's acrylic on canvas. These are its dimensions. And if you win the bidding, you will get the physical object represented by the picture here. OK, so what did uh, Beeple's thing say? Beeple's thing was uh, every day, the first 5,000 days, there it is. And uh, the artwork that I made is very much influenced by the tools and influenced by the work of a bunch of people in the crypto community as well. Hey, Mike, this is Jason. I just want to say congratulations. You're at 25 million, 250,000. That's crazy, man. Jesus Christ, what the <gasps> Oh my God! Oh my God. Oh my God. Nine million. I think it probably means digital art is here to stay. I'm going to Disney World. <laughs> Sixty-nine million dollars for that NFT. 
that starts to feel like real money, even if it was originally in cryptocurrency. That's how much uh, it was paid for in dollars by uh, to Christie's. So like they really made sure the check of a traditional form cleared for it. And like, how did we get here? In fact, what what just happened? I find myself asking that a lot on <laughs> internet stuff. Like, what just happened? And uh, we should just look at it a little more closely for a moment. So uh, here's back to the details page. It has uh, a smart contract address. Here again is the work. Um, the smart contract address points to this work uh, in a way I'll show you in a second. Now it's a little bit weird because this is a $69 million work, one of the top 10 most valued uh, works of art in the world right now. And I'm just showing it to you. I, I, have I taken it? No, 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 of course not. I'm just showing you the work and uh, my Zoom is going slowly. There should be something appearing on the screen because it's on my screen. This is what Zoom doesn't want you to know. <laughs> Should I like hold my thing yeah. up and say, oh, there it is, okay. So uh, this work can be found at this link. Anybody can type in this link and when they do, they will get a 300 megabyte JPEG that uh, Chrome will start sagging under the weight. And then it has like that little uh, zoom in, don't click that or that's it, your Chrome is toast. Um, a Chrome post, mm -hmm. but uh, 500 megapixels, 300 megabytes, and again, it's yours to enjoy. Like, go to that, and you too can download it and find me the screen that could show that in all its glory. And uh, you've got a, a high risk. So, then what did the person who bought the NFT actually get? And again, I find that puzzling too. Um, here's the smart contract address on the Ethereum blockchain. I would know it anywhere. And uh, if you go look at that, you see that it points to another link, which is the smart contract, which has just basics about how stuff gets transacted uh, on this blockchain for this kind of object. It's the 40,000th or so use of that contract. And here's the owner. The owner is Beeple because he has announced that that's his wallet. And again, I guess people who are real fish, oh yeah, of course that's people. Like I know that address like the back of my hand. Mm -hmm. And this thing in turn points to this address on the IPFS, which is the- Interplanetary file system. Now, normally you would think that's just a weird joke, right? <laughs> but no, it's actually the interplanetary filing system because the internet has weird ways of making weird jokes into real things that still feel like the joke is on somebody and we're not quite sure. And uh, if you then go to that place on the interplanetary file system, which I invite you to do, it's open for anybody, you go to that place and then this is what you see. This is, the, this is it, this is it. It is the metadata, data about data, which is a text file with some structure to it. And you can see, uh, he wrote, I made a picture from start to finish every single day. Uh, this is my every one of those pictures. And uh, then it has another link to this, and this link goes to a website, which then redirects into the IPFS again, where you end up going from here over to there, which is the thing. So, I mean, if you're thinking this is kind of like a Matryoshka doll sort of set where it's like, wait, so what am I getting? It's pointing to a, a link that points to a metadata file that points to, yes, I think it is kind of like that. In fact, it's really more kind of like this. And it's like, what did the person that bought the NFT get that we didn't? What they got was the right to have the Ethereum blockchain represent a single transaction showing the movement of the token you just saw from people to the buyer. That's what they got. Is that worth $69 million? I don't know. There's a quote from the buyer who is pseudonymous saying that he is confident that that token will be worth a billion dollars someday. And I wish them luck. So uh, blockchain, like invented by Satoshi Nakamoto, our friend Wiki tells us that we don't actually know who that is. In fact, it's probably more than one person and there's speculation and somebody has claimed it, we're not sure. 
So we have a thing we're not exactly sure what it is, invented by we're not exactly sure whom, producing tokens that are only worth hexadecimal strings of numbers that otherwise all of us can get whatever they get. And there's somehow $69 million involved. This kind of confusion multiplied across multiple blockchains. I mean, how many crypto coins are there? I don't know, there's an ongoing list at um, uh, the Coinopsy site. And anybody contribute to Coinopsy? Anybody have a coin of theirs featured on Coinopsy? It means your coin is dead. And as you can see, there are uh, 2,200 entries and counting, but anybody can make their own coin. Isn't that wonderful? Um, this is the kind of thing that gets produced by a generative system. A generative system meaning one that invites contribution from anybody and there's no gatekeeper to say, that is a profoundly dumb idea. No. It's just like, you know what? You do you. You want to make a blockchain? Make a blockchain. You want to say why it's valuable? Great. See if it works in the marketplace. If somebody wants to pay $69 million to affect a transaction on the chain, maybe that'll work, maybe it won't. And it turns out that that is a current sort of synecdoche of the way the internet itself has worked. And technologies didn't have to be generative. This is maybe generative at a textual level because you can type any text you want on this old typewriter. But the way this typewriter works is set from the moment it left the factory. You can't reconfigure the typewriter to do something different than what it does. And for a while, the future of the typewriter was that. This is the brother smart word processor, which was like yesterday's technology of tomorrow. Here's its main menu. The way it acts, it doesn't get firmware upgrades. This is the appliance you bought. And how it will work is defined by the brother company, call it Big Brother, and you will use it however you use it. That was for a while seen as the future of technology until circa 1977, Steve Jobs comes along with this thing called the Apple computer. And for the first time in a single form fitting case, you have a thing you can hook up to a television set. Talk about repurposing. Get a blinking cursor, and you're like, that's so cool. You just watch the cursor blink. There's no main menu. It's up to you to type in a program like 10, print hello, 20, go to 10, and be like, I love computers, and watch to see it go. It also means that third parties can write stuff. People that aren't Apple can write code for the Apple and others can run it, and Apple isn't in the middle of that transaction, no gatekeeping. So in this case, you have something like VisiCalc, the first spreadsheet ever digitally, and the business world is like OMG. And suddenly Apple computers are flying off the shelves, and Apple has to do market research to figure out why their hobbyist computer got so popular. I see it's because every Fortune 500 company now needs 10,000 of them because Two folks in Boston invented VisiCalc on Cape Cod. It's a little bit weird. And then you have all sorts of other computers like this wonderful old PC that just runs any software you hand it. If it's executable, it executes. Totally different from the Royal Typewriter, from the Brother Smart Word Processor. And that leads to an entire industry of off the shelf software that you buy or that people share with you. And that is the kind of ground zero of our digital revolution over the past 30 years. And there was a similar move in the network space. One telephone company in America, AT&T, that's the whole thing. And then along comes the internet, a totally weird, not expected. IP does not mean intellectual property here. It means internet protocol built by a bunch of engineers who are kind of doing it in their spare time and claiming no intellectual property ownership of it and slicing the whole digital world into these modules so that you can be an expert on ethernet and you don't need to know about anything else. If you have fast ethernet that you make, that's great. People can buy it and run internet protocol on it and that's their business. And that means that any kind of innovation can happen at any layer without having to coordinate with another layer. And it's the hourglass is because it's really wide on the top. You can run any app. It's like an executable for the network. It's whatever anybody wants to invent works over internet protocol. 
And similarly, it works over whatever medium gets invented. Sometime we'll have Wi-Fi figured out. We don't yet, but when we do, the internet's gonna work great over it. And it's such a strange way of organizing things. This modularity, we haven't talked about it, but it's worth making a bookmark for packet switching, of packetizing information so that you can shove a ton of information from different people over one pipe and not have to keep passing the pipe back and forth, but just have it fail gracefully as too many people use it. It just slows down for everybody rather than just being allocated to one person perfectly and everybody else has to wait in line. It is such a radical proposition that it really did lead to the question of whether the internet could even work. As late as 1992, IBM was saying you couldn't possibly build a corporate network using internet protocol. It's too weird. It's too unreliable. And you could say the same thing about blockchain. You could say the same thing about the interplanetary file system. You could say the same thing, surely, about Wikipedia. Like, just imagine, great idea, everybody. It's an encyclopedia that starts with one article. And then anybody can just come along and type more. Others can edit it at any time. They don't have to put in their names. And before you know it, you'll get a good encyclopedia. Oh yeah, it'll be in 200 and some languages, right? That is a profoundly bad idea. <laughs> but that's why the mascot of the internet engineers in their spare time, the internet engineering task force is said to be the bumblebee because the wing to fur ratio of the bumblebee is said to be too large for it to fly. And yet miraculously, the bee flies. Pleased to say in 2006, they finally figured out how the bees fly. Obviously, this is an introductory talk that's almost over. So I will just say they flap their wings very quickly. <laughs> so there you have it. But it means then that somebody like Tim Berners Lee can come along and just in his spare time, like he's not busy enough as a particle physicist at CERN, he's like, you know what? Time for World Wide Web. Here's the protocol. All we have to do is have everybody use this protocol to build web pages with links that link to other pages, and to have other people build browsers that understand when you see those utterances of web pages, how to paint them into pretty pages. All right, world, the rest is up to you. I'm out of here. That is a abridged version of how the World Wide Web comes about. There were other competitors too, but this one worked with Tim having no privilege in the middle to decide what websites come and what websites go. So you end up getting a wheel of cheese cam in Somerset, England. People can tune in and watch the cheese ripen. You end up with people registering domain names originally for free. It cost nothing to register a domain name that nobody else had registered. So here in 1994 is the journalist Josh Quitner being like, nobody has McDonald's.com, including McDonald's. He calls up McDonald's. He's like, did you know you don't have your own domain name? And they're like, I don't know what you're talking about. So he got the domain name. And then later called up McDonald's and was like, hey, do you want to make a donation to a good cause? And I'll give you McDonald's.com. And they were like, we're going to sue you. And he was like, you can have it. And that was that. <laughs> um, and I mean, I just can't resist but find the other story that at some point, um, Princeton Review ends up registering Kaplan.com, test prep, and putting up some funny site about um, Kaplan at Kaplan.com, even though it's Princeton Review, just to goof around. Kaplan was not amused. John Katzman, who ran Princeton Review at the time, said, if you give me a case of beer, you can have PrincetonReview.com. They threatened to sue him, leading to this wonderful quote, one of my favorite of that era, which is, Kaplan has no sense of humor, no vision, and no beer. <laughs> so it's kind of weird. McDonald's finally gets McDonald's.com, this is the very first website, McDonald's.com. And it, it looks a little basic, I think. Uh, I don't think you can actually order something. There's no infrastructure for that. But um, everything looked kind of like this in 1996. Here's eBay in 1996. This is the homepage of AuctionWeb that would become eBay.com, uh, welcoming you to join the community of buyers and sellers. And here's a personal note from Pierre Omidyar talking about how this is a grand experiment in internet commerce, and it's about honest dealings. And most people are honest, but there are some bad ones, but you know what, we'll drive them away, but we need your active, this is like internet governance version 0 0.4, but it worked well enough for eBay to become eBay, 
and to do much better than $69 million when it went time to go public. There have been these weird gold rushes, whether over websites, over domain names, which were kind of the NFTs of 1998, right down to NFTs right now of strange things that people get excited about and that nobody has vetted beforehand and that represent various people for varying motives, including greed or wealth maximization, I think we call it law school, um, or you know, governance experience or doing good in the world of some kind, anybody can set up shop and try to do that. And that's how like our center over the years has been inspired to just build stuff generally in the public interest, whatever the many folks at the center who won't agree with one another about exactly what that is, that's suitable for debate. But whatever you think the public interest is, let's see if we can build that. This is the original Creative Commons website built at the Berkman Klein Center that then became Creative Commons, which was a way, as everybody was contributing generatively to the internet, there was actually not a way to signal how and under what circumstances, including possibly all of them, you wanted to share your work. And Creative Commons came up with a way to indicate easily how you wanted to share your work so that then people could reuse it and feel comfortable doing so. This is an example that of an organization with some public minded goal that was able to just start building something, not only writing a paper saying it should happen in the world, and the rest then becomes history. Wikipedia itself is a great example. I've already indicated that like it might seem like a bad idea, but the thing has grown, and I remain amazed. I don't know how many Wikipedians are among us right now? A few, I see one. We are all Wikipedians. It's kind of a Spartacus kind of line. But um, I don't know if you're editing an article right now, but you could be. And I mean, just like whether it's really reliable, pretty well vetted, sources written in plain language in multiple languages about something like COVID, you've got it, or you've got, I don't know, Deaths of Wikipedia is a great account, a list of sexually active popes, or um, here is a list of inventors killed by their own inventions. <laughs> like, yeah, I would, I would, I would read that. Um, or uh, this is uh, another favorite, uprisings led by women. Like there's all sorts of stuff on Wiki that is inviting contribution from anywhere, kind of the way that Pierre Omidyar was inviting contribution from anywhere to make eBay safer and help its IPO value, or Sean Fanning in the year 2000, 22 years ago, over a spring break was like, you know what? What if we took file sharing, which already exists and anybody can do at any time on the internet and made it that you could only use it to share MP3s? So if you get rid of everything else but MP3s, I'm going to call it Napster. And over the weekend was a huge challenge to the music industry, which had been releasing compact discs that had zero encryption on them that anybody could rip and then go ahead. I think the statute of limitations has passed. Anybody ever ripped a CD? Was that? Yeah, all right. Good times? I don't know. Um, but these are the kinds of things that like when it really became understood just how powerful the generative technology was. It was discomforting to any kind of legacy operator that depended on consumer technology being a certain way. And if you fast forward now to the 2020s, I think it's safe to say that maybe many, if not all of us feel a vague sense of unease about what this free for all system has produced in, in different ways it challenges all of us, whether it's about security, pick a password, don't reuse your bank password, we didn't spend a lot on security for this app, oh, okay, right, there's no general standard for security, I, all right, I, I will not ask how many people reuse their passwords, because I think this is being videoed, and I, I'm just not going to go there, but um, that unease has gotten kind of deeper and deeper as we've contemplated exactly what the internet has wrought, whether it's about privacy, which this is an ancient uh, issue of time, uh, worrying about uh, privacy, but like, this is even more ancient. This is from 1966, people worried about privacy 
online. And it's like, I don't know, if you went back to 66, you're like, so things in some ways have gotten better. But on this particular concern, I can't say we've really fixed anything. That's a pretty sad thing to be saying whatever uh, the dimension might be. And that's why I think things are sort of getting more intense around our discomfort juxtaposed alongside any feelings any of us might have about joy, that there could exist such a spontaneous and unmonitored and ungate kept instrumentality. And we see it online with brigading and ways in which people, particularly marginalized and minoritized people, are driven out of a discursive sphere because of the lack of gatekeeping of somebody having responsibility and willing to own up to that responsibility for the space. And those sorts of things, again, are problems that remain not only unsolved in practice, I think they remain unsolved in theory. <laughs> I've been thinking that like the two big problems of internet governance in this era our first, we don't agree on what we want. And second, we don't trust anybody to give it to us. We don't trust Facebook. We don't trust governments. Librarians are now somehow iffy. I, I thought they were great. I identify as a librarian. And now like they are under attack for their role in playing their jobs. So uh, this open house comes at a time and wherever you are in your journey, you're joining us, we're coming together at a time when this is not just like only how cool so many opportunities sky's the limit. There's a lot of stuff going down that might be striking deep disquiet or worry. Last example, just uh, in AI. I mean, those uh, people remember Tay, Microsoft's initial foray into an AI bot that engaged in online learning, meaning that it changed how it behaved on the basis of how people interacted with it on Twitter. What could possibly go wrong? And sure enough, here is Tay at T equals zero. Uh, the, the Tay's billing was it acts like a nice teenager. So there it is acting like a nice teenager. By midday, it is, I think, confused about what it's about. And by the end of the day, it is ready to be blocked. Like, it's just like, you've got to be kidding me. And Microsoft is like, okay, we have, Microsoft has a corporate blog. It's like, we have pulled the plug on pay. We regret it, et cetera, et cetera. The biggest entities, many, but not all of which started, right? This particular one in a Harvard dorm room about a 10 minute walk away, end up themselves the legacy entities that somehow are falling short on the degree of power they can wield and lives they can affect. And there remains questions, some of which they're hazarding answers to, like an independent, independently funded oversight board, for which some of our affiliates are members of that board. Other affiliates are intense critics of that board. But it represents some effort to figure out a way out of what feels like a maze of dead ends around the problems that this incredibly generative technology is generating. So from 1997 until 2018, that's Wired's covers representing very different views of how the internet has gone. And that brings us just to today within this building and within our virtual existence, which is far more capacious than this even lovely building, the efforts that are going on here with our partner centers and others around the world, network of centers that uh, BKC started, that how has how many people, how many entities in the BKC network of centers now? 109. 109. And that's not fewer than before, right? That's still going up. It keeps going up. It keeps going up. Good. Okay. The, the slope of the curve is also positive. Around the world, trying to use the very tools about which we might feel ambivalent to figure out how to use them in ways that produce generatively something that feels and is positive. Here is the particle accelerator at which Tim Berners-Lee, inventor of the web, worked for really big moonshot kinds of things like smashing elementary particles together. It used to be that universities 
with government subsidy was how it happened, like the CERN particle accelerator. These days, ambitious digging of holes in the ground, I'm sorry to say, is like kind of this. <laughs> and I, it feels different to me. This does not feel like that's where to lead these kinds of projects. I even think back to this paper from 1998 talking about search engines and the ways in which if there is only the commercial and no nonprofit or academic counterpart, you end up with some way in which the entire environment is canted so, so that the public interest is not represented. Who wrote this paper? I don't know if anybody has read it recently, but this paper was the paper that introduced Google and it was Sergey and Larry who first raised the issue of advertising as causing mixed incentives, meaning that you need a search engine in the academic realm. So uh, I and others are aware that there are all sorts of incentives and ways in which the action and AI, the data and the PhDs have moved typically from the public realm, the .edu, the .gov, and its counterparts around the world. This is uh, our colleague, Matt Walsh, who 10 years ago got full professor and within three months was like, I'm out of here, I'm going to Google. <laughs> because at Google, that's where the real stuff is happening. And it's worth more than a big, it's like big office? I don't know where he was stationed. <laughs> but <laughs> Google is the dream. Well, maybe in 2010 it was, but I think for some there's even realizing the limits of that. And it has me and others thinking about what is it to have a responsibility wherever you are parked, dot com, dot edu, behind the counter at McDonald's, wherever it might be, what would it mean to have to and, and be thinking of the public interest and the implications of what one does? There are originally three learned professions that were meant to have duties beyond profit maximization for oneself. They were divinity law and medicine. In the 19th century, what did we add to it? We added surveying. Surveying became the fourth learned profession because it's really important to know where your land ends and someone else's begins. Well, maybe it indeed is time, <coughs> such as with this Zoom censored uh, modern data scientist, to think about other professions whose degree of subtlety of work, power that they can exercise in the world and obscurity of it to others means that maybe they should join the regular learned professions in thinking about and flagging the implications of what they're doing so the rest of us can talk about it. I'm mindful of Arthur C. Clarke's third law, any sufficiently technology is indistinguishable from magic, itself a restatement of something the bracket said more bluntly, witchcraft to the ignorant, simple science to the learned. This is the kind of thing that has me obsessed with wanting to figure out exactly what is happening when somebody says $69 million was paid for an NFT. I hope it's what makes you curious too, regardless of how much technical expertise you believe you possess or are bringing to the table. It is our hope for this multidisciplinary center and center that transcends academia to draw in people from those other domains, .com, .gov, .int, not ARPA. Anyway, there are a lot of domains now, not chef. Um, to see where are our spots where we're missing stuff that others can see. And through dialogue, largely facilitated by these tools, how can we come to better understandings, develop interventions that might make the world better according to some uh, mode of better and pilot them and see if they should grow the way something like Creative Commons grew. In one corner, I think, are the nerds. They think that the technological realm doesn't really apply to them with limits because they can code their way around it. Over here are the folks that are like, I don't use technology, so I'm not bound by it. Doesn't help still if there's like a terrible Wikipedia entry about you. The fact that you're not online and don't see it doesn't mean it's not hurting you. In the middle is kind of everybody else. And I really worry about a state in which so many of us don't really know what's happening in the world or have a framework through which to understand it, much less to judge it and to better it. It is the project of our center. We hope 
that you'll be able to join and partake of and contribute to. And for the science fair style thing that's going to happen next year, you'll see so many projects that in a generative spirit are trying to make a difference with different methodologies and different angles that you can join us and be part of a generative system for which it's inviting our contributions. Others are already making them. What might you like to do in your own sense of the public interest to make things better? This is just a snapshot of some of the folks in the extended Berkman Klein Center network, some of whom are here today, some of whom are online, some of whom are staffing tables. I just really hope you'll join us and I thank you for coming out and I thank our staff, our fellows, our affiliates, our faculty. Sue, thank you for pulling all this together and making this possible. Thank you.